Hey everybody, it's Mike. I want to respond to a question that came on to the channel recently. So in one of my recent videos, I, you know, as I do in the middle of ranting about something, I said that, I probably said that uh, the codependent is a tasty treat for the borderline. But I also said, uh, but um, the borderline is also a tasty treat for the codependent. And so somebody asked how, uh, I, that they would like to know how the borderline is a tasty treat. So I'd like to address that. So, um, by the way, if you're new to the channel, this channel is for non-borderlines who have been in or are currently in a romantic relationship with somebody who does have borderline personality disorder. It's a very real thing. It's not just somebody who's got issues. We're talking about a very specific mental illness and it um, creates tremendous amount of uh, tragedy and pain and trauma to both parties. They're both victims of this same thing. But as I have said, uh, only codependents are attracted to borderlines. If you have been in a relationship with a borderline for more than, in my experience, like a few days, you're, you're codependent. Because somebody who isn't codependent, first off, they're not going to be attracted to a borderline, and a borderline is not going to be attracted to them because they don't have that same black hole in their gut. This is what drives... Uh, drives them together. Think of it like gravity. The unresolved love, the unresolved need for, you know, base love that we had as children creates a black hole. And this black, as you know, black holes have huge amounts of gravity and they just pull everything into it. And I remember, you know, in my relationship with my borderline ex, it felt like that. It really did feel like I was being pulled into a deep, dark, evil black hole and that she herself was also just in it, flailing around. Um, so that the black hole is the emptiness that we have inside of us, the need to be loved, and uh, it's a very tragic, very deep, very intense need. Somebody who's not codependent is not going to be attracted to them and if they get involved the moment that the borderline splits or does the things that they do or you know makes the codependent responsible for their feelings because borderlines live through their codependent that's that's your job your job is to be something that they try to live through and so somebody who's not codependent is going to feel that immediately and is going to not want to be a part of it so it's that, that emptiness inside that causes this attraction where they come together. Now, from the perspective of the codependent, what is happening is that the codependent came from a dysfunctional childhood and trauma where they were constantly seeking to get that closure, that final love, you know, that let them know that they're okay that let them know that they're worthwhile. The mother or the father, who knows what you're, you know, in my case, my father was uh, an alcoholic and my mother was obviously, um, I think she had borderline tendencies as well, codependent. Um, and so that created within me uh, this need my entire life to constantly seek out women that were emotionally unavailable, that were very... Um, very exciting and very um, seductive and very sexual and seemingly very, um, you know, very affectionate. But then when it came down to real intimacy, they would then, you know, be unavailable. And so it would create in me this um, pattern, this dynamic where I'm constantly chasing after something I can never achieve. And borderlines just, uh, you know, they, they create the ultimate unattainable intimacy uh, target. 
So what creates the tasty treat for the codependent is that this is where the codependent thrives. The codependent thrives in being in a relationship with somebody that is just out of reach, just barely out of reach. I mean, you can smell it, you can taste it. It's almost there. If you just do this or if you just do that, it'll all come together and it's just almost there. And when you reach out for it, they move just in time. They do the come here, go away. You know, go, you know, go away closer. And, um, but what makes the borderline just the absolute irresistible uh, object is that, that on the one hand, they present this very um, close, intimate, emotional connection. They, 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 they create the promise of this close, intimate, emotional connection. And on top of that, uh, at the very least, on an unconscious level, the, the codependent senses that they have that same black hole within them. If they exhibit some other problems like depression or drug addiction or some other kind of dysfunction that stimulates within the codependent their projection of themselves, you know, their own need, their own helpless little child, if the, the borderline presents some kind of symptom that stimulates that, then you've got this, this uh, dynamic of chasing after the love that you can almost touch and we'll get there, you'll get there eventually, you're almost there, combined with, oh my God, they're so helpless, they're so broken, I'm going to be the hero and swoop in and fix them. And when I do, they will turn around and love me. Again, that is a projection, meaning that that is what the codependent wants for themselves. They deflect. They don't get honest about what they want. They have all the power and all the control. And bear in mind that being a codependent is, a, you know, an insanity of control. What you want to do is control. And you may not think that. You may think, no, I just have this loving. I just have nothing but love and empathy. You know, I've had people on this channel get furious with me about they're not codependent. They just have a lot of empathy. And you need to stop telling me I'm a codependent. Right? See the irony there? Um, if you really were just somebody who had a lot of empathy and wanted to give, it wouldn't make you so angry. So it, it uh, stimulates their desire to actually, um, you know, it's a chase. And so the codependent is chasing, you know, imagine a, you know, a lion chasing after a gazelle. The codependent is the lion chasing after the gazelle, the beautiful gazelle that's so tasty with all of the love and the intimacy that it's promising. But just out of reach. You almost got it and you're, you're almost there. And, um, you know, the, the fantasy is that you will catch it, control it, and then consume it. In this case, it'll be the love. The, the catching it and, and controlling it and consuming it will consist of finally doing and sacrificing the one thing, showing love in that one way that will then make the borderline helpless to run away, make the borderline realize, oh my God, that's the love I've always been waiting for. You're the one. Okay, here I am. You can have me. And then the, uh, the codependent will then reap all of the love. But make no mistake, you are seeking to take somebody hostage. You are seeking to take somebody captive. Then you are seeking to devour the love that you believe that they have. Now, of course, all of this is happening on an unconscious level. There's also a lot of rage involved because as a codependent, you know, some of the most rageful, especially passive aggressive people are codependents and they're full of rage. That's why when people get so upset with me a couple of times, um, when I when I say, you know, again, I don't even know you. This is the strange thing. I don't know who you are. I'm just talking to air. 
but people respond as though I have targeted them specifically and I am you know, pulling their dirty underwear and saying that they're this weak, disgusting, just pathetic, codependent, needy. They just get so upset, you know, and they, you know, I have got to stop talking like that because I'm spreading lies. But that's the case. Otherwise, you wouldn't be with a borderline. You know, you know, think about it. There's a lot of really needy people in the world. There's a lot of people with a lot of intense, crazy need. There's a lot of really tragic, insane people. I mean, you walk by, you know, if you live in an urban area, you'll walk by insane people talking to themselves all the time. You don't go and sit down and say, I want to take care of you. Let me take you home and bathe you and feed you and get you a job. You don't do that with them because they, they don't have anything to, you know, that stimulates you. The borderline stimulates you because it reminds you of, a, of yourself, but an even more, even worse uh, experience of yourself. Uh, so that's the tasty treat. The tasty treat is the love. And bear in mind, there's nothing wrong with consuming and enjoying love when you get it. When you're in a relationship where two people are giving to each other, you know, that's what it is. You know, people use each other. The question is whether or not the, you know, the using of each other is mutually beneficial. And this is where true empathy comes into play, you know, uh, the act of, of lovemaking is a really good example. You are selfishly driving to get your pleasure and your action of get, trying to get your pleasure is what is the other person wants and, you know, stimulates their drive to get it from you. And it, as you know, it creates this crescendo, but it's, it's this, this combination of selfishness and selflessness and vulnerability and, um, you know, seeking to devour somebody and being devoured. It's, it's, you know, ideally it's both parties are enjoying it. So what's happening in the case of the, uh, the borderline, it's like a really hellish, you know, jujitsu battle for who's going to devour the other one first. Um, because your experience as the borderline is you're the victim. The experience uh, of the codependent is the same, that they are the victim. If you talk to each one of them, they will tell you why they are the victim and why, you know, you're taking from me and you did it to me. From an objective standpoint, um, it's easy to side with the codependent if you get out of it and say, well, you know, the, the, the borderline has some unrealistic uh, uh, experiences, you know, they project onto the codependent that they're being rejected, tortured, and, you know, um, destroyed, which is their own experience of themselves because the intimacy triggers them to go back to the original uh, trauma when they were an infant. And that's why the, it's so extreme. That's why the, the codependent is more functional because whatever the trauma was that happened to them, it didn't, you know, the sequence of events didn't happen in early infancy to the point where they broke. So they have some semblance of, of self and they're able to have some, um, you know, some consistency in their behavior with other people and they don't project as intensely but they still have this need. They still have this childish need to be loved and accepted by mommy and daddy and whoever else. And the, you know, what's interesting is that we all know that the borderline projects and transfers onto the codependent, that the codependent is a parent. This is one of the most um, subtle and uh, deceptive part of the relationship with the borderline is that the codependent doesn't consciously realize that the borderline sees them as a parent. And this is one of the things you need to understand if you know you're trying to find out 
you know, will it ever work between me and my untreated borderline and should I go no contact and all of that. The one thing you need to realize is, is that if the borderline is severely borderline and is untreated, they cannot see you as anything other than a parent figure. In fact, they see everybody that way. But very specifically with the romantic partner, the romantic partner is and always will be the parent. And the re one of the reasons why it's doomed is because their original parent abandoned them uh, at a very early age um, so that they have the intense feeling of rage and fear and need that an infant has for a parent that is abandoning them. So imagine, you know, an infant crying, just scream crying for hours and nobody there to take care of them. Whether or not that was the actual case or not, I don't know, but that's a good representation of the feeling that they have. That's why they respond so intensely. That's why they are so attractive to codependents because codependents have some similar scenario and the borderline just represents, you know, in its purity, the purest form of their uh, need and their feeling of abandonment. And so they, they're, they're chasing after it, trying to, to heal themselves, thinking that they're being loving and kind and, you know, whatever else for the borderline. So I hope that helps. You know, I'm kind of babbling here, but that's kind of the idea. So, you know, if you want to heal and you're a codependent or you're an empath, you know, <laughs> I make fun of that because let me, let's talk about the empath because I hear this a lot. I, I even like if I'm, you know, now that I'm, I'm devoting some time to this channel, I go and I look at other channels and I, I got onto a channel and there was one woman who was talking about, I, I don't know what she was, I think she was talking about codependency, might have even been talking about, um, you know, borderline codependency. And they said, if you're a codependent or an empath, so she, she already just has that experience that I have, which is that there are people who don't want to uh, acknowledge that they're a codependent or can't tolerate the thought of being a codependent. But they will instead say that, no, I'm just an empath. And people will say that they are, you know, they have this gift that they're, you know, this, that, that they have a spiritual gift of empathy and they can't help but feel all of the feelings of people around them and take them on. And so there's this badge of honor. You know, the difference between a codependent and a cod codependent says, listen, this is my selfish, narcissistic, unresolved pain that I am acting out in relationships that are destructive to me. So they're owning that they have an issue. The empath gets to hide behind this, you know, this, this, you know, this Boy Scout or Girl Scout badge of empath. No, I'm an empath. Well, of course you're an empath, but if you're truly an empath, then you're going to be able to feel that the borderline is totally incapable of loving you back. If you're truly an empath, you're going to go inside and you're going to go, ooh, that individual is not only incapable, but that individual will split on me. So you're, you're working at odds with yourself if your, your belief about yourself is that you feel everybody's feelings and yet you don't have the ability to actually distinguish the difference between their pain and your pain. So you're really not an empath in that sense. The other thing is that both borderlines and codependents are extremely empathic and extremely intuitive seemingly psychically so and i'm open to the idea that they could be psychic but it doesn't take away the reason that they became empathic to begin with and here's how it turned here's how it happens it's the same for both borderlines and codependents whatever your situation was in childhood you had a dysfunctional uh narcissistic you know unavailable abusive something like that uh, parental uh, home environment. Because you were a child, 
you had no choice but to to create a love bond with those people if you had been an adult and you were fully formed you would go wow these people are really unpleasant and um, they're damaging to me so I'm gonna distance myself I'm not gonna expect anything from them but as a kid you know your your survival depends on them your survival depends on them loving you so that means that you if you've experienced them being giving you double messages or being abusive or being neglectful or shaming you whatever it is maybe outright physical abuse whatever it is you better be able to figure out what they're gonna think so you energetically unconsciously psychically even begin to start creating these feelers that you can go into what they're thinking you become masters of deciphering micro uh, expressions you you just become brilliant at at being able to determine most of the time what they are about to say what they are about to do at the same time what ends up happening is that you then um, you train yourself to imprint on dysfunction so rage anger uh, apathy you know all of those things become equated to mommy and daddy's love so you become really empathic with people's negative emotions this is why empaths say no I just I'm an empath and I take on everybody's negative feelings and I can't help it I'm just a giver I'm a lover it's not it it's that you are seeking to number one without realizing it you've been imprinted to feel love or feel loved when somebody hates you because that's the way mommy and daddy treated you and you had to turn that into love and learn to love that and enjoy that because they were the ones that were providing for you and taking care of you so you're attracted to people who exude that you're attracted to people who exude that negativity who exude that you know all those things and then boom your superpower kicks in and you start empathizing being able to figure out what they're gonna say what they're gonna do and so you start planning this dance of how to get in front of that so you can try and figure out what it is that they want so that they will give you what you want which is love sustenance in some cases food clothing shelter because you got imprinted that way it becomes a survival instinct that stays with you all through adulthood unless you consciously choose to go and do something to change that which is what therapy and 12 step groups are all about let me just talk about the 12 steps for a second anybody who's gone to 12 step groups one of the two main things they say is one I don't like saying that I'm weak which we can talk about another time the other one is they'll talk about how screwed up everybody there is and they're all religious or they're all messed up or they're all full of crap yeah they're sick that's why they're there that's not why you go you go to learn the 12 steps which are the most brilliant form of a behavioral therapy to change those programs in your brain to change those tracks in your brain so you learn to get rewarded when you do actions that are constructive as it is now as an untreated borderline or codependent your brain gives you rewards dopamine when you act in unconsciously destructive ways to yourself in the case of the codependent when you're chasing the lion chasing after the gazelle that you can just barely catch and if you can catch them and wrestle them to the ground they'll you can then feast on the love that they're offering they're like the beautiful gazelle here I am I'm lo I got I'm love I'm the best love you ever had oh, just missed me oh, just missed me okay come on no get out of here it just it gets all those endorphins running in your brain because as a little kid that's what you had to do to get mommy and daddy to love you so the ironic thing is that both the borderline and the codependent see the other as the parent when I became aware of that 
When I became aware of first what borderline personality disorder was and what was going on with my then, you know, off and on partner, I became aware that she was operating from the aspect of a traumatized infant, which only then increased like the incredible pain that I felt for her and still to this day, which is why, you know, I keep, I use this as the icon because that when I became aware that that was her constant state of reality, it just created such this need in me to take care of her and heal her. But the truth is that the picture of that little girl is me. I want to heal that crying little baby inside of me. That's why it's that's why you feel this overwhelming pain and empathy for the borderline. Doesn't mean that you don't actually have love and empathy for them. It's 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 not an either or. It's a this and that. So when I became aware that this was her actual state of being um, uh, and I became aware of all of the intense projection that I was doing and transference that I was doing onto her and how ironic it was because that crying baby is completely incapable of taking care of my needs. That baby is nothing but need. That baby cannot take care of you. Can't. It can't love you. It, it, it's, it's right now in just a scream cry at, from nothing but need. It doesn't, it can't even like wipe its tears and take a breath and go, okay, now I'll take care of you. As was evidenced in my experience with my borderline ex when I did that and when she literally was that. And uh, probably for the first time in her life, I, I sat there with her wiped her tears and just gave and gave and gave where she, you know, took it in and just, you know, loved it. She'd never, nobody's ever loved me like that before. And then she's like, okay, now let's go to the store. And I was like, hang on, <laughs> I'm, I'm drained and I'm messed up here. I need, I need you now to give me some loving. To which her response was, I'm not going to drop everything just for you. That's because... That little baby doesn't have anything to give. Can only take. And from this baby's perspective, that's your job to give to her. She doesn't have anything to give. It's not her job to give to you. That's why it's insane of you to think that they're going to turn around and love you. That's why the only thing they know how to do is love bomb. The only thing they know how to do is act like they love you because they know that's going to stimulate your response to then love them back. And then they're gonna sit in that, once they've got you loving them, then they're just gonna sit and let you love them. Until ironically that stimulates true intimacy, which will take them right back here. And that's when they split. When they split, this is what's happening. Because they can't escape it. The sad, horrible part is without treatment, they cannot escape. They're trying to escape. They want you to pull them out of that. They, they want the same thing that you think you want, which is to be fixed and to be okay. But the moment that your true love and true intimacy takes hold, it uh, regresses them back to this. And remember, they're broken. They're stuck in a loop. They can't get past that point of why. Why, why, aren't you, why don't you love me? Why did you reject me? Which is why the moment that you start to love them, the first thing they do is, is act as though you've just rejected them. This is why it's a mental illness. Do you get it? It's not just somebody who has a lot of pain, who has an issue, that if you can just talk to them and love them, they'll take it, patch themselves up, and then move on. They are constantly in this cycle. That's it. They're never outside of that. Do you get it? Borderlines, do you get it? That's why you need therapy. That's why you can't go. That's why you borderlines are so brilliant at manipulating your average therapist. Because the average therapist doesn't understand. They think that you can patch yourself up and walk away. They don't realize that, that you know, behind, you know, that this is what's behind your very smart ways of, communicating and seeming like you're you've got it under control but 
you and I now both know that you don't have it under control and the poor idiots out there don't realize that. So uh, I hope I explain what it is. So bottom line for the, the codependence, this is a tasty treat because what it does is it keeps you in the state of continuously chasing. They're the perfect uh, object for the codependent because they will never truly allow you in. They will never truly allow you to love them. And so there's no chance of it ever, of you ever being mirrored back in love to. Let me tell you this, codependence. You think you want love more than anything else in the world. And if only somebody would love you. The truth is, if somebody honestly reflected back and loved you, it would be so frightening to you that you would run away. Or, how about this one? They're just so boring. Normal people are so boring. That boredom is actually your way of hating them because you don't understand what love is. It's so uncomfortable for you. For you, you have been imprinted to believe that love is being rejected. And so when you're continuously, you know, come here, go away, come here, go away, it keeps you in that constant state of not facing your own crying infant in your unconscious mind. All right? Anyway, I could keep going on and on because I'm really trying to get to the heart of it and I don't seem to be able to do that. That's why I keep talking through it. But those are some things to be thinking about and to chew on and... Um, that's it. If you, I, I appreciate the dialogue. So feel free to put comments on there. Feel free to put questions on there. Also be aware, you know, that if somebody is uh, aggressive, abusive, passive aggressive, even if they're not trying to, I'm going to address it uh, because I think that's helpful. And I can get away with that because I'm not a therapist. If I was a therapist, I would constantly have to be, you know, the separation. And well, that's an interesting... But because I'm not a therapist, I'm just a, somebody like you, I'm going to reflect back to you and I'm going to respond to you from just the normal person's perspective. And I think that's one of the things that, that that's what group therapy is about, by the way, if you've never been to group therapy, is that there's a moderator who moderates and is professional and then the people in the group, you know, respond and reflect back to each other. And then the moderator makes sure that, you know, people act civilly in it and still allow to hear everybody's feelings about it. So I'm going to respond to you just like I would if we were in group therapy. If you're passive aggressive, if you're in denial, if you're aggressive, if you're abusive, um, if you're right on track, if you, you know, if you and I are on the same wavelength, I'm going to reflect that back to you. So let's see how that works. It'll be an experiment. All right, that's it. Talk to you guys later. Oh, and uh, by the way, um, the little baby over here is crying because you haven't subscribed yet. So you have to, you have to stop her from crying. And the way to do that is to, uh, is to lightly mouse over her and then subscribe. And then she'll stop crying. Okay? <laughs> See you later.